before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Located in the northern part of Italy sits the town of Turin. Within the town of Turin is, of course, a Catholic church. The cathedral in Turin allegedly sits on an old location from the Roman Empire that was at one point an amphitheater. In 1610, the Duke of Savoy decided that he was going to make an addition to this cathedral. You see, the House of Savoy, this regal elitist house, the rulers of northern Italy, this family, the Savoys, had been in possession of this alleged holy relic. And this Duke of Savoy in 1610 decided that this addition to the cathedral would house and preserve this particular holy relic. The addition, the chapel that would house this, this relic, would go on to be called the Chapel of the Holy Shroud. Because allegedly, the House of Savoy had held on for centuries to a linen shroud, because allegedly this shroud showed the face of Jesus Christ. For centuries and centuries, my friends, people have been arguing over whether this linen cloth, this shroud, was legitimate or a hoax. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without our patrons or our producers, we would not be able to do what we do. This channel is pretty much crowd funded. And so I truly, truly, truly appreciate all the people who find it in their heart to help us out here so that we can keep the lights on and keep bringing you deep dives here on Esoteric Atlanta. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today on Mystery Monday, my favorite, favorite subject of the week, we're going to be talking about the Shroud of Turin. Now, I feel like this mystery has been a long time coming. For many of you, you've been around this community for a few years now, and you probably remember that my channel got big because of my deep dives into the missing books of the Bible. If you weren't around for that, there is a playlist from The Dark Outpost where I do have a lot of the missing books of the Bible that I researched a few years back. Now, because of that, because of all the work, as what happens in the entertainment industry, I got offered a position a few years ago to work on a project called The Jesus Strand. This was a multi-part documentary that was basically created to kind of try to uncover the truth about Jesus and what really happened. Now, I want to make something very clear, which I didn't think I had to make clear because I thought this was common sense. Whenever you do a documentary and you have different people come on to talk about different elements of the story, the people that you have on the documentary are not necessarily aware of what the other participants are speaking about. I know that's been very confusing for people who have followed the Jesus Strand. The only research that I stand behind in the Jesus Strand is my own is the missing books of the Bible. As far as everybody else's perspectives and their research, 
That's their research. And frankly, a lot of what was said in the Jesus Strand documentary, I don't actually agree with. And we're going to get to that at the end of this episode, because it does have to do with the Shroud of Turin. Because if you guys remember, that was brought up with the Jesus Strand. If that's still hard to understand, let me explain it to you this way. On this channel, I have covered a couple of times the Georgia werewolf because I find that story absolutely fascinating. So let's just say that I was going to do a documentary about the Burt family, where the Georgia werewolf comes from. So if I'm going to do a documentary about the Georgia werewolf, this story started in the 19th century, so the 1800s. I'm probably going to have a lot of different specialists. You know, I'm going to have folklore storytellers come and tell us the general story of the Georgia werewolf. I'll probably have people that have studied folklore with like shape-shifting to come and give their perspective. I'll probably have somebody that specializes in historical culture of the Deep South in the 19th century to come and talk about what life was like for that family culturally in that time. Now, with that being said, if I have somebody on the documentary that's talking about deep Southern culture in the 19th century, they don't necessarily know the story of the Georgia werewolf because that's not their part in the documentary. Their part is to talk about their specialty. Same thing with the Jesus Strand. I was brought on to the Jesus Strand to simply talk about the missing books of the Bible. That's it. All right. Um, I was not scripted. In, in documentaries, you typically aren't scripted. You're typically free speaking about whatever the subject is that you specialize in. So for the Jesus Strand, my my specialty was the missing books, the Bible, nothing else. In fact, I don't agree with most of the other stuff that was presented. But that's okay because we are allowed to have different opinions. We're allowed to have different perspectives. We have to come out of this place of thinking we all have to agree with each other because if we all agreed with each other, nothing would get done. Nothing would change. There would be no innovation. So with that being said, again, if you watch the Jesus Strand, then you probably remember them talking about the Shroud of Turin, which was, again, the linen cloth that was used on Jesus, allegedly. And his blood type was spoken about, the AB blood type. I have all that information. I'm going to talk about my opinion on that at the end of this episode because it still is considered a mystery. We still don't know for sure whose body that cloth was on top of. Now, I'm going to have to be careful with the words I say because, you know, YouTube, I don't make the rules. Don't 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 hate the player, hate the game. Um, but I think you guys know what I talk, I'm talking about when I say when Jesus was unalived, the whole basis of the Christian faith, basically. So to start this just briefly, let's review the last few days of Jesus's life. Now, again, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that I prefer to use the name Yahshua, which was his real name. Jesus was not his real name. The J sound did not exist at that time. And Jesus does go back to the Dionysian cult, which we have covered. If you missed that episode on the Dionysian cult, I will put that down in the description box below. But nonetheless, for this story, I am going to stick to the name Jesus, which I think you'll know why I'm doing that at the end of the episode, if you care to hear my opinion. So according to the Gospels, the Bible, most of us know this story, regardless of whether you grew up Christian or not. If you were from the Western world, you probably are very familiar with the Easter story of Christianity. So Jesus of Nazareth was unalived. Again, I have to be careful how I say this for basically blasphemy, right? He he was handed over Pontius Pilate, the Roman, he was the, which was the Roman government, the, the Roman Empire had a part in this, which we're going to get to with the history of these types of unalivings within the Roman Empire after we kind of briefly go over Jesus' story. We all know it. He was basically had to be because that was pot punishment for being blasphemous. And so, of course, back in those days, the way that they unalived people was pretty brutal. I mean, for most of history, unaliving people has not been clean like it is now. It's It was pretty inhumane. And so one of the forms that the Roman Empire used was, of course, using the cross. And it wasn't actually a cross. It was more like a pole. But we're going to say a cross for a lack of a better word, because again, I am trying to watch my words because of YouTube's terms and services and regulations. 
We do know that they had a crown of thorns that was put on Jesus's head. It was supposed to mock him as being the king of the Jews or, you know, you know, it was all mockery, right? And he had to walk up the hill and he, you know, so basically within six hours, Jesus was pronounced unalive. Now we had Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene and all the mother Mary, all these people were there having to watch this horrific event happen. And these people, as we're told, were Jewish. They were of the Jewish faith. Again, we're going to get to that at the end of this episode. And so the Jewish within the Jewish faith, the Sabbath is considered the holy day, which is Saturday, the day of Saturn. And so this was on a Friday evening. And so within Orthodox Judaism, especially back then, I know some sects of Judaism still practice this. And if you are Jewish, I would love to hear any corrections that you have because I'm not Jewish or any thoughts that you have on the matter within the official gospel story that we're told about the passing of Christ. So it's it's getting close to sundown on that Friday, which we now call Good Friday. If you grew up Christian, you understand what Good Friday is. So Joseph of Arimathea, one of Jesus's disciples who actually owned the property where the tomb was, where he was going to be buried, said to the Roman soldier, you know, they're getting kind of stressed out, right? Because within Orthodox Christianity, once the sun goes down on Friday, thus starts the Sabbath religious rituals and so for a jewish person this is stressful like listen my opinions aside on what really happened or didn't happen i am totally a stress case like i have anxiety through the roof i am ocd so this part of the story like i i empathize heavily with this guy joseph because you're a practicing Orthodox Jewish person and you have to keep the Sabbath holy. But this guy that you claim is your Messiah that's fulfilling this prophecy, he's in the moment of leaving his body behind in a very horrific way. And according to your customs and your laws, once the sun goes down, you're in the Sabbath. I, I listen. I mean, like I said, like I get this, even though I'm not super religious and very spiritual, but I'm not super religious. I, I can understand this. What is it called? Sc scrupulosity, where you, you're just so OCD about religious practices. So I totally get like how panicked Joseph of Arimathea and, and, and all the people that were there with him that were also practicing Jewish people. I mean, what do you do? Like this guy that you've your teacher, you, your Messiah, like you need to stay here, but your your rules and regulations, the sun's about to go down. I mean, that's definitely very stressful. So Joseph, it states in the gospels that Jesus takes his last breath. And so Joseph goes to the Roman guard to make sure that he's he's gone so that they can take him and, and quickly, quickly get him into his tomb before the Sabbath starts. So the Roman guard, we all know this story, pierces his side, you know, the water and the blood are separate. So that means that, yes, he is no longer with us. And so they take the body and they quickly take him to the tomb. They put this sheet, they do the customs that were um, the Jewish customs at that time. They put the shroud, this linen sheet over him, which was done. They close up the tomb for the Sabbath. And then that Sunday, Magdalene was the first. The story goes, they come back to the tomb, probably... You know, my, I'm thinking because they were quickly trying to get his body up there, they got to come back and just finish because now the Sabbath is over. But of course, Easter Sunday, the tomb is empty, right? He is risen. There's no body. All that's left is the linen shroud. So that's kind of a very Cliff Notes version of the Gospels. And this, again, is the basis of the Christian faith, as we are told in our modern times, that, we, that is, it is a Judeo-Christian faith, meaning that in the Jewish um, prophecies, there was going to become come a Messiah who was going to basically save the world, and that was going to be fulfillment of prophecy. We've gone through all of that with the missing books of the Bible, because not actually what the prophecy said, but again, that's a story for another day. Today, we're talking about the the Shroud of Turin. Okay, so that's the basic story. So does that make sense for people who did not grow up Christian? Again, trying to watch my words. 
um, I don't know if I can say the C word, you know, um, he was unalived by the Roman Empire and they put this linen cloth over his body and it, because of the blood that was coming out of his body, it basically imprinted his features onto this shroud. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So that's how we got here. So that's how we got this mystery of this Shroud of Turin. So anyway, so the Shroud of Turin, or what it's more commonly called now the Holy Shroud, is a linen cloth that bears the image of the front and the back of a man. For centuries, it has been believed to be the actual burial shroud that was wrapped around the body of the man known as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we have no record of this shroud before the 14th century. We don't know where it came from, how it came into existence. So I'm going to kind of go through what we do know of the history of this linen cloth. But again, it's really sketchy as to where this shroud came from before the 14th century. Now, many historians have tried to make educated guesses. And this is something I found super interesting when I was studying the history of the shroud for this episode. Apparently, back in, like, before the 14th century, like, you know, between like the Council of Nicaea and the, you know, fourth century, you know, a thousand years later, this whole time, which makes sense, totally makes sense. A lot of people throughout Europe, especially as this Christian faith was growing, were looking for relics. And we've talked about this before. And I will tag some of these videos where we've talked about the mystery behind some of these relics down below if you want to watch them after this. And at this point, historians do know that there were multiple shrouds that were kind of floating around uh, Europe and in, in, in the Byzantine Empire, where people believed it was the Shroud of Jesus. So it wasn't uncommon to have like 10 different shrouds out there that people were like, oh, yes, this is Jesus's shroud. And again, I didn't know that. So that kind of is is interesting to me that the, we, we, we think about this Shroud of Turin as being like the only one. But throughout history, there's been multiple, multiple shrouds, right? And if the story of Jesus is true, there should only be one, right? Because he was just one person. So this is, this is fat. This was very fascinating to me. So what historians kind of guesstimate, what they assumed happened, we know that Constantine, whom I've spoken about a lot on this channel, that psychopath, Constantine, we know that he moved the Roman Empire from Rome to Istanbul, which was Constantinople, like he named, like, like any good narcissist, he named it after himself, Constantinople. And that became kind of the head of the Roman Empire and this newfound religion of the Roman Empire, which was Christianity, which actually was Mithraism. But that's, again, a story for a different day. We've talked about that before. And so when that happened, we know that Constantine himself, allegedly, along with his mother, took a lot of relics from Jerusalem, claimed to have some of these relics of like parts of the cross, all that kind of stuff. And so that he brought it with him to Constantinople. Well, over time, we have the Byzantine Empire all, you know, a thousand years is a long time, right? It's a long time for stuff to happen, for, for boundaries to be moved. You got the rising of the Ottoman Empire, all that stuff, right? A lot of battles in the Middle East. You guys, you guys know about, we know, we know, we know, right? And so, so historians guesstimate that the Shroud of Turin, the one that we're talking about specifically, because there were so many, this was one of many, was in possession of the Byzantine Empire, but then got lost with the sack of Constantinople in 1204. So 1204, Constantinople is sacked. It, it's invaded. And of course, any time a booming empire is invaded stuff is going to get destroyed get lost i don't know if they actually had a black market back then but there probably was some sort of illegal trade going on and the, they didn't have the, the tracking the way they, that we track now obviously and so it was probably easier to just move stuff around relics around without anybody knowing because if this is the case if this is where this shroud came from 
we don't see any sign of the tr of the shroud again until over a hundred years later in 1053 because we don't see this shroud again until 1353 in northern central france and this 1353 timeline is when we actually keep track of this shroud so from 1204 to 1353 if the historians are correct this shroud moved from the Middle East all the way up to northern France. And wouldn't you know it, but it was in the hands and the possession of a very, very affluent family in France. And it was in a town called Lyry, France. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not French. Obviously, I'm American. I got French heritage, but... French, French is a very difficult language, so I apologize if I'm not saying that correct. But nonetheless, we have the shroud now in possession in Lyrie, France. And this famous family, this, this knight that owns this shroud, is a guy named Geoffrey de Charnay. And Geoffrey de Charnay, like his family is like super fancy. You know, here's the gossip, here's the tea. His family is super, super fancy. His parents... A little nepotism here. His parents were really good friends with King Louis the Ninth. In fact, his family was such good friends. Like I'm in my head, I'm thinking like his parents were having supper club parties. They were going to cotillions, like we do down here in the south, with King Louis the Ninth. They were such good friends that King Louis the Ninth of France allowed his parents to do his actual biography. And so you got to really trust somebody if you're going to have them do your biography for historical measures. Now, King Louis the Ninth, for those that care, we've talked about him before because apparently King Louis the Ninth had himself a lot of relics, apparently, allegedly, from the passing away of Jesus of Nazareth. And I will, uh, he had apparently the crown of thorns. There is a lot of stuff that this King Louis the Ninth had, allegedly. We've covered that in past videos from many years ago. I'll tag those down in the description box below. But I thought that was fascinating when I saw that. King Louis the Ninth is also known as Saint Louis. If you are from St. Louis, that is who your city is named after. So this king is kind of a big deal. Like he's kind of a big deal, especially in the Middle Ages in Christendom. And the fact that he already allegedly has some of the relics of Jesus of Nazareth makes me wonder if maybe, maybe, just maybe, this is just my speculation, that he himself had the Shroud of Turin and he gave it to his besties, this Geoffrey de Charnay's parents, and then Geoffrey de Charnay ended up possessing the, the 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 Shroud of Turin, right? Like these are nobles, these are knights, these are wealthy people, you know, like they don't need any more money. So what else can they have that makes them feel like they're powerful? Well, relics from a, an alleged religious figure. Well, Geoffrey de Charnay was, again, he was a knight too, and he was very um, prominent in the Crusades. He was also prominent in the Hundred Years' War. So he was just like a fighting dude, you know, like he was just out there doing his like knight stuff and like fighting. And he ended up losing his life at the Battle of Poitiers in 1357. So that's the last we know that Jeffrey had possession of really anything because dude's not alive anymore. In 1350, uh, 56, excuse me, 1356, the Battle of Pontier. We do know that the shroud, however, does stay within this particular family. Because in 1453, almost 100 years later, Jeffrey's granddaughter, Margaret de Charnay, all of a sudden needs money. Like for some reason, their money is gone. And so she decides that she's going to sell this relic to the House of Savoy. And the House of Savoy are a ruling family of Italy that was established in 1003. So they've been like a big deal for about 400 years. So if anybody's got the money to pay Margaret de Charnay for this Shroud of Turin is going to be the House of Savoy. So this is how it ends up with the House of Savoy. Now, something interesting, if we back up just a little bit, in 1390, so between Jeffrey's unaliving and his granddaughter selling the shroud, the local bishop of this little town in France is like, y'all, this is a hoax. So 
by 1390, we're starting to see people go, I don't think this is actually what you think it is, which I found so interesting. So like for hundreds of years, we've literally been going back and forth on whether this belonged to Jesus or not. But the bishop was like, y'all are being fooled. This ain't nothing but some random person's shroud. It does not belong to Jesus. This is a hoax. He actually said not only was it a hoax, but he threw the bishop before him under the bus proverbial bus because they didn't have buses back then but he literally was like yo the dude who was the bishop before me he paid an artist to create this shroud talk about scandalous tea if you're new to this channel i mean my my old friends on this channel know the reason why i love history so much because history is petty gossip if you want to look at petty stories and petty gossip just study history it is so freaking petty and this bishop in 1390 basically gave the bishop before him the middle finger and accused him <laughs> accused him of faking this even though it belong to the Jeffrey de Charnay, like the besties of, of the king, like talk about gossip. I cannot imagine what the gossip was around the watering well or the bread market at that time. Like talk about some petty gossip. But nonetheless, 1453, even with the bishop being like, yo, this is a hoax, most people thought it was real, right? Especially people, influential people. And so Margaret de Charnay, the granddaughter of Geoffrey de Charnay, whose parents were besties with St. Louis, Louis the Ninth, sold this linen, this marked up linen to the House of Savoy, who again was the ruling House of Italy. And this is where the shroud stayed with the House of Savoy for a very long time. In 1532, the shroud was slightly damaged by a fire that the Savoys had done what they could to try to preserve the shroud. But of course, this was the 16th century. I mean, nothing is foolproof, even in 2024. And so this is going to be important, though. We're going to come back to this fire when we look at the scientific work around this shroud in modern times to try to get more answers. But it was slightly damaged by a fire in, in the, the 16th century. In 1578, the current Duke of Savoy decided to bring the shroud to Turin, where it has been ever since. Hence, it's now called the Shroud of Turin. And then, of course, as I said in the opening in 1610, that Duke of Savoy decided to build an extra little special chapel to house this relic. In 1898, the first ever photograph was taken of the shroud, and so people from around the world were able to now see this supposed relic from Jesus of Nazareth. But before that, I will say, before that had happened, the House of Savoy, even though they were like super wealthy and aristocrats, they were kind of like, in my mind when I was studying this, it, it sounded almost like a sideshow, like a freak show almost, like the way they used to do back in the day. They would kind of tour around with this shroud and let people come sick, like, pay money to come see it. So, you know, we can say that this 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 relic wasn't just something to keep in their family heirlooms, but was kind of like an investment for the House of Savoy too. But nonetheless, in 1898, with the invention of the, the camera, everything kind of changed because they were able to take a picture of it and therefore more people were able to see the shroud without actually seeing the shroud, which is super cool. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm super glad that we have cameras and photographs and YouTube and stuff like that. But, you know, but, you know, it's still better to see something in person. And so by building this chapel of the whole or starting to build this chapel of the Holy Shroud in 1610, which it took a little while to build, kind of gave the shroud a home base. Just like if you go to England and you want to see the, the royal jewels, you go to the Tower of London and they have a whole case where you can walk in and, you know, it's guarded and you can actually see the crown you know, all that kind of stuff. So that, that's kind of in my mind what the House of Savoy was doing. They had gone and toured with the shroud to show it to people. Now they're going to build an actual, like a, a medieval renaissance, not medieval, like a renaissance museum for people to now come to them to see the shroud. And then in 1898, we got photography. So even more people, you know, and I will say too, with photography, it, it's also more people. And as we come into the 20th century, 
and the uh, industrial revolution and all of a sudden you know you look at the 20th century where most of us were born in the the 1900s you know born i was born in the late 1900s we were born in a century where there was rapid expansion rapid discoveries you know from from you know 1900 to 2000 it's just so vastly different and so we're coming into that where not only are people able to see the shroud but the information that this shroud even exists is able to spread like wildfire. And we know that Christianity, especially in modern times, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, religion in the world. And so for a lot of people, especially for Catholics, I feel like Catholics are a little bit more into their relics than Protestants. I don't know, us Protestants, especially the Presbyterians, the agro Presbyterian, we just like to drink. So, so, you know, I feel like this, this, the shroud kind of made its, its big debut kind of in the, in the turn of the, the 20th century, because now more people knew of its existence. In 1983, the actual year in the late 1900s that I was born, um, the house of Savoy actually gave the shroud to the Holy See. And I'm always confused by this Holy See again, I grew up Presbyterian, we don't got no pope but the holy see is basically part of the it's the pope basically like what he has jurisdiction over he's also called the holy see and so in 1983 the pope was john paul ii pope when i was born too and so he now the catholic church is now taking possession of the shroud of turin so in the 20th century again before the 20th century as as late as early as 1390 we had skeptics even in the church skeptics going i don't know guys this they don't think this is a the the shroud of of jesus um but in the 20th century because of technology especially when the catholic church took ownership of the shroud we were able to do more studies into you know scientific research into the validity of this cloth basically but before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about the history of, and again, I have to be careful about how I say this, but unaliving people, especially in the manner in which Jesus Christ was unalived. Now, I think sometimes, because that is such a brutal way to go, I think sometimes, especially in our modern times, I don't think we realize that this was not uncommon. You know, here in the United States, where I live, it's going to be different for different countries. We have capital punishment, and which is basically what that is. Um, it, it's a state issue, like the state I live in has it. Most states have it. And there's really only two offenses that can get you capital punishment. One is first degree unaliving, which it's, it means it was like planned. The other is treason. Right. Other than that, you're not going to really have capital punishment on the table. But back in the Roman Empire, in even even more modern history, you could be given that judgment. Again, trying to watch what I say, you guys, given that judgment for simply stealing a loaf of bread. And so life was not I mean. Life is always valuable. It's always important. But it, the likelihood of somebody being unalived by the government was so much higher than it is now. Now, with that being said, this form of unaliving, this legal form of punishment was done. It was common, but it wasn't super common. There's actually a professor here in Georgia, in LaGrange, Georgia. His name is John Granger Cook. And he estimated, when I was researching this, and I was researching this form of unaliving, he estimates that 100,000 to 150,000 people were unalived by in this manner by the Roman Empire between 200 BC and 337 AD. So this is the, the time period of Jesus of Nazareth. And so even though that actually for like 500 little over 500 years, that's kind of a small number. So that means they're probably less than 200, according to this professor, less than 200 of these types of unaliving per year. Now, with that being said, in 2024, 
the fact that there were even 200 people going this way is shocking. It's shocking. Like, I don't think any of us would be able to stomach that in 2024. I mean, I even think the guillotine, the videos from the 70s of the guillotine, I can't watch because it's so disturbing. But with that being said, unaliving people for punishment was a common, a common punishment in that time it just depended on i guess what the crime was as to how you were removed from this world we'll say now with that so so with that being said it, it, we have a ton of people in our history who have gone this way a ton of people who had bodies just like jesus who were removed this way now one thing that's interesting though because the shroud of turin does show what looks like there have been a crown of, 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 of thorns because in this shroud, the actual imprint of the man is made by blood. Okay. It is, they, they've tested that it is blood. Okay. That's what made the imprint. And so it does appear that this man did have a crown of thorns on. Now, what happens when they put a crown of thorns on your head? You have these little capillaries, and especially the head. There's there's not a lot of, of, of space between the, the skull and the, the, the skin. And so this happens a lot when you, like, get hit in the nose. You know, your black eyes, you'll get, like, the capillaries within the skin will burst. Now, with that being said, it's not, comp it's not, not as painful as some other stuff that he went through uh, allegedly in this unaliving, but the crown of thorns is probably the least, the least um, painful. Um, it's probably just more annoying than anything. So the, the blood on the head was coming from the busted capillaries. Now, what the the apologist and the, the church will say in, 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 in support of this shroud being that of Jesus's is that yes, even though this was a common punishment, in the Roman Empire, the fact that this shroud has markings on uh, blood from where a crown of thorns would have been proves that this was actually Jesus. Well, hold the brakes. Again, we know from the Gospels, as I said earlier, that the, uh, the soldiers put that on his head to mock him as being the king of the Jews, right? And so a lot of apologists will say that, therefore, he was the only person to ever have a crown of thorns. That's not true. It wasn't common to see this done, but he was not the only person to ever have a crown of thorns on his head. And I don't believe that the Bible actually says he was the only one. I just think that that is something people assume or speculate about. But it wasn't done in, in every single one of these um unalivings but it wasn't uncommon to see that on somebody's head but they to see the remains that have been done to more people for whatever reason now we know that these that the cross actually it wasn't a cross back then it was a pole it was more of a pole that they were on it's still disgusting regardless but we all but but regardless of how he was nailed you know, I think sometimes, especially when we look at like stigmatas, which is something I actually want to cover in the future is stigmatas. We see people bleeding from the palm. And if you don't know what a stigmata is, there are people in the world who have basically felt and bled in places where Jesus bled, like they'll, they'll bleed and they feel the pain. It's like, we're going to cover them, but it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's super fascinating that there have people who've had these stigmatas, right? So sometimes when people have the stigmata that we see the blood coming from the palm. Well, we know, and I, I've known this for a while, that you can't put anything through the hand. It's just going to fall off, right? There's not, the, the bones in the hand are very malleable. They're not super sturdy. So where this would have gone, where the nail would have gone, would have been through the wrist, now, here's where my second love in life, anatomy and the body, this is where I get to geek out a little bit. Your wrists are super flexible and your wrists are actually pretty strong. Even though people break their wrists from time to time, they're actually pretty strong. 
I mean, honestly, I don't think the wrist gets enough credit. It it literally is able to move. It's very mobile, which mobility in the body is a combination of both strength and flexibility. So within your wrist, you have these eight little bones. And these are called carpal bones. And they are responsible. These eight little bones in the wrist that are super strong and flexible are responsible for attaching your hand to your radius and ulna, which are the two bones in your forearm. Right. So these wrists, they, they do a lot of work. Yeah. So when you're in this process of being unalived and I keep putting my arms out because that's the picture we always have of Jesus, but it was actually on a pole. So I don't know where this would have happened, but they, they actually insert the nail here because it holds. Right. It holds. It's not going to fall out like it would in the palm. And on this Shroud of Turin, we can definitely see markings where it would have been on the wrist. To me, that doesn't mean anything because, again, this was how this was done anyway. They were just following protocol. So I, I maybe that was shocking to people because we always assume it was the hands. It, it was not the hands. It was, it was the, the wrist. Now, according to historians who study this particular time period and especially these methods of unaliving, this particular method of unaliving, generally speaking, took somebody 36 hours to go. Cannot imagine the pain that you must be in for 36 hours. And the manner in which people leave is different. Again, I'm trying to watch my words. So some people will leave because uh, they're dehydrated. Um, some people in this method will leave because of tetanus, because of the open wounds. Some people would leave because of exposure to the elements, again, with the open wounds. So the leaving process was slow and torturous. Another way that people, a lot of people, would leave in this process of leaving is asphyxiation, which means that they could not breathe. So how this would happen, how they would be asphyxiated was because their legs would be broken. Now, part of me sees this as a mercy. You know how in the witch trials, sometimes when they were burned, sometimes friends would bring them a packet of G-U-N powder so it would be fast. I kind of see from my perspective, and I'm not, I'm not a medical historian, but this is just kind of what I speculate when I was studying this is that this was kind of mercy Well, for two reasons. We'll get to the second one because how they would not be able to breathe would be their legs would be broken. And so if you're either like this or, or like this, and you've got your feet on something, you're able to push up subconscious. It's probably not a conscious thing to get breath, but if the legs are broken, you can't get breath. And so part of me thinks it was mercy to do that to people. However, another thing, another reason why this was done. Now, this this again is how brutal the Roman Empire was. The soldiers, the Roman soldiers who were responsible for kind of guarding this madness. Sometimes what would happen is that people who were going through this unaliving process would go into a coma and there would be very little breath coming in. And so they would be mistaken for being unalived. The guards would think that they were gone, but they weren't. And so what would happen is they would take the body down and give it to the family. The family would take it to the tomb. And then a little while later, the person would kind of like come out of their coma after they had their body had time, which is amazing that they could do that with all the cuts and scrapes and bruises. Well, the problem is for the Roman soldiers, even though this was a mistake that they didn't intend on making, they thought the person was gone. For a lot of these soldiers, for a lot of this time, if they were responsible, their job was to make sure this criminal, whatever you know, crime they'd committed, if their job was to make sure that the, the punishment was met, you know what I mean? And it wasn't. So if they were supposed to make sure someone was unalived and they weren't unalived, then the soldier themselves 
could have been unalived, if that makes sense. I wish I could use the real words. I really wish I could. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to, to use the real words. So the Roman soldiers would sometimes break the legs. Not only was it, I, I feel like, merciful because it ended quickly, but it was also to ensure that the person was not in a coma, but had actually left to save their own lives. There was another method in which the Roman soldiers would do this, and that was a sphere in the side, right? So we see this with, we know that Jesus is from the story from the gospels. We know that his legs were not broken. And some people will point to the shroud of Turin because it looks like this person, whoever this was in the shroud, his legs were not broken. And people will say, oh, it's because it was Jesus. No, no, no. So there were two methods, again, that these Roman soldiers would do to ensure that the person was unalived. And that was either breaking the legs or stabbing them in the side. So what the, as we spoke about earlier, according to the Gospels, when Joseph of Arimathea was freaking out because it was getting close to the Sabbath, the Roman soldier, you know, poked him in the side to see if he was gone. And he was because water and the blood were separate when it came out. Now, according to the shroud, we do have, it's between the fifth and the sixth rib. We do have a marking where there was blood on his side. So those who are in favor of this being Jesus's linen will point to these things and say, see, it matches the gospel. But then again, the argument is, yeah, a lot of these unalivings match the gospel. Now, with Jesus's passing, we have him only being in this torment for about six hours. And some people will say it's because he was the son of God. That's why it wasn't 36 hours, but six hours. And the argument to that is from medical historians. Yes, there is such a profession as a medical historian. I did not know that until I was researching this. 36 hours is just the average, right? Just like the average lifespan is what, like 70, 80 years old? Doesn't mean that everybody's gonna live to that. And some, some might live for longer, some might live less. It's just the average. So the fact that Jesus only took six hours, it doesn't mean a whole lot because it's just under the average. Now, a lot of medical historians have also believed that it, it was quick for him because his heart ruptured, which that must've been painful. But anyway, that's kind of their, their reasoning for that. Now, again, as I said earlier, because of the, uh, the coming Sabbath, the people who took Joseph of Arimathea, which according to the Gospels, the tomb that Jesus was put in was property of this guy, Joseph, because he was rich. And he had so that he gave him a burial site. And so we know that Joseph of Arimathea was very prominent, was like a big player in the end of his life. And we know that his mother and Magdalene and some other women were were responsible as well for getting him from the from Calvary, basically, to the tomb. And we do know that because of the coming Sabbath and because of their strict ordinance, according to the Gospels, they had to get him in the tomb quickly. And so they wrapped the body very quickly in the linen. And they had to leave themselves because they had to go observe the Sabbath, their plans to come back after the Sabbath, to finish whatever ordinances and rituals that they needed to finish of course that's when the tomb was the body was gone and it was just the linen right so so we know that that the body originally was hastily put up in this tomb and so when we're looking at the gospels and we're looking at this shroud and we're trying to determine whether this was jesus's shroud or not we have to let the shroud itself tell its own story we can't constantly rely on confirmation bias from the Gospels. We have to have a very open mind and just let the shroud tell us from whence it came. So as I said, in the 20th century, us, us humans, we created, as humans, created a group of scientists whose main job was to study the shroud. Let the shroud tell them its own story versus us trying to create a story around the shroud. And this group was called STIRP. And man, oh man, has the drama continued with STIRP. It's wild. The, the different scientific studies they've done, the different hypotheses all these different scientists have had. Because if you know anything about science, you know 
that the point of science is to question everything. The point of science is to have a theory and then try to disprove your own theory. But before we get into that, I, I do want to give a special shout out to one of our sponsors here on Esoteric Atlanta, Spooky2. Spooky2 is a rife machine and I cannot get over how many people are benefiting so much from this particular machine. So we're going to listen to a quick testimony about someone's fur baby who has definitely, definitely benefited from the spooky too and also saved his human mama some money. And if, if you are interested in having your own spooky two machine, you can use my name, Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E-W-A-T-S-O-N at checkout. Link is down below for 5% off of your purchase. Welcome to the Ricky Zen Den. I'm here with my dog Bourbon, and he wanted to share a little bit about his story so that we can help other pet parents know that there are other holistic and alternative methods out there to helping your dog on their road to recovery and healing. So a little bit about Bourbon's story. We had him, um, he was running, let's say, and it was a, a rainy day, and he went to run up the steps, and he skipped a step and landed spread eagle and left out a huge yelp. Um, so thankfully, my son carried him down the steps for me, got him in the car, and we took him right to the vet. So they confirmed that he did, in fact, severely tear, um, basically completely both of his ACLs or what's called a CCL in dog lingo. And they said that he needed surgery to heal and recover. However, he was only eight months old at the time and they would not do surgery on him because his growth platelets were still open in his legs. So they sent me home with an injured dog and said, bring him back when he's a year old and they would do the surgery. Now the surgery, mind you, was gonna cost $5,000 per leg and two months recovery in a crate while he was recovering. And the surgery had to be done one leg at a time. So that would be $10,000 and four months of him being in a crate. That doesn't sound like a good solution to me. So I encourage you to go to Spooky2 and download their software just to kind of look around and see if maybe your ailments are in the database, because I bet you they are. So now let's get into it. So the first thing I did with Bourbon is I took the connectors and I hooked him up to the TENS pads. So what I did is I took the TENS pads and I placed them on the inside of his thigh by where his knee is. So right around where the actual ACL or CCL would be located. And then I ran what we call a biofeedback scan. The biofeedback scan in the database, what it does is it sends electromagnetic frequencies into your electromagnetic field within your body. Anything that is not supposed to be there, it calls a hit. So it records up to 10 hits per biofeedback scan. It takes about five or six minutes and boom, you have your, your results. So then, once I record and save those hits, I turn around and I switch it to contact mode, keeping the TENS pads in the exact same spot that I just ran the biofeedback scan, and then I run a 30-minute contact session for him. Now, he feels so amazing when he's getting these frequencies that if I'm in messing with the Rife Therapy machine and getting something ready maybe for myself or a client, he will actually come over and be like, hey, thinking he's going to get a session. That's how much he loves it because he knows it's making him feel better. All right, you guys. So we left off with STIRP, this group of scientists that their whole job is to let the Shroud of Turin tell them its own stories. And you guys, the twist and turn these this group of scientists has experienced is wild. They even, y'all, I mean, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that we know that history might not be totally accurate. 
I'm cool myself personally. I'm cool with like not totally under like I can hold like the Tartarian timeline and I can hold an official narrative in my head and acknowledge both of them until we know the truth. But we do know that there were probably some advanced civilizations more advanced than we are now that lived before we lived. And one of the hypotheses, my friends, I bet you anything the powers that be were so relieved that this was not theory that proved to be accurate. Because one of the hypotheses was that this was a photograph. Y'all, could you imagine the controllers of the world being like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Oh shit. <laughs> like, like, if this had been, because you know, we know, we know on this channel that there is theories that, again, that there have been civilizations that have been on this planet before us that were way more advanced than we are. In fact, I've got some more stories about some archaeological evidence that I want to cover because it's like, where the hell did that come from? Where did that Swiss, 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 let me try that again. Where did that Swiss watch come from in a Ming dynasty tomb like there's just stuff that's not adding up the math ain't mapping and so one of the hypotheses from one of these scientists was like oh my god you guys this is a photograph <laughs> a photograph of somebody was like oh look a body and took a photograph and it was just really big and I can and the, the fact that the other scientists in this group are like, yeah, that could be legit. Means in my mind, in my mind, means that I think, okay, they know stuff that we don't know. Because if all the other scientists were like, yeah, we can test that theory and not be like, you idiot, like this, this was 2000 years ago, there were no cameras. Like the fact that they were willing to entertain that means that again, I think that this group of scientists knows a whole lot more about our history than we actually know because this hypothesis was not laughed down. But the reason why this photograph theory proved not to be true is because they pulled out the particles of, they were able to pull some of the linen, you know, to test it, which, you, you know, and um, it was blood. So not a photograph, not a photograph. But again, I'm like, can we circle back to this? Because why, if the official narrative of history is true, why did the scientist totally be like, yeah, cool, we can test it to see if it was a ancient camera photograph? Like, let's circle back to this and explain why no one was shocked about that. Because our, our, it, come on, powers that be, we, we ain't stupid. Like, you're telling me that a hypothesis was that this was a picture from 2000, a photograph from 2000 years ago, and none of the scientists blinked an eye at that? They were willing to test it? None of the scientists were like, ha ha ha, very funny, there was no photography 2000 years ago. None of them. They were all like, yeah, cool, we should test it. Why weren't they shocked by that? Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Some people believed, again, that this was burnt, that it was another way of doing art. But once again, the testing of the blood proves that it was not burnt. Some people thought it might be candle wax that was used. Again, all of this was eliminated because of the blood. Now, the blood that was tested, that came, the, the, the blood type that came up was the AB blood, which was covered in the Jesus strand. Now, here's something interesting, though that they didn't cover in the Jesus strand that I thought was fascinating. You guys know that I'm super fascinated by blood types. I've covered many, many blood types. I myself am O negative. That's what started me on my journey of studying blood types because of all the shenanigans that happen around the O negative blood. I will put some videos down in the description box below if that's something that's fascinating to you. Different blood types do give different personality traits for sure. But no one thing I want to make very clear, no one blood type is superior to another. There's no elitism, like it's all good. You know, just like no one race is superior to another race. It's just, it is what it is. Like there's just different side effects and different personality traits you're gonna have depending on the blood type, but it doesn't make you better or less than anyone else. So I wanna get that very, very clear. The dark side does believe that there are better blood types, but we ain't on the dark side, right? I personally believe we're all God's children and whatever blood type you have is the blood type you were supposed to have for whatever your experience is in this life. So I want to make that very clear. But something I found super fascinating, you know how I said back in the time 2000 years ago when Jesus was around, that wasn't his name because the J sound didn't exist back then, it was Yeshua. 
Well, something else that wasn't around at that time was the AB mixture blood. So we have A blood and B blood, but the AB, according to these medical historians, did not exist during the time of Jesus. Really fascinating. We're going to come back to that. So I, I wanted to just let you guys know, do your, as always, don't believe me, just do your own research. So AB blood did not exist during the time of Jesus. So we know that the dude, whoever blood this is, he had AB blood. So that for the scientist was like, well, this kind of rules out this being Jesus, but let's keep testing. Where did this come from? So in, uh, in October of 1988, so five years after the House of Savoy gave the, 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 the linen cloth, the shroud to the Pope, Five years later, they decided to take part of the linen and test it to see how old it is, car like carbon dating, right? Which is something we can do. It's not always accurate, but I do think in a lot of cases, it does give us a pretty good idea. And the carbon dating took the shroud back to 1350, which means that according to this particular carbon dating, it started in France with Geoffrey de Charnay. The dude whose parents was friends with the with the king, that guy, according to this carbon dating. Now, with that being said, a lot of people were very uncomfortable with this finding. Now, of course, I think for anybody, not just scientists, for us included, all human beings have a confirmation bias. We we want to believe something is so, so we look for we look for patterns subconsciously most of the time to confirm for us what we want to be true, right? And I think for this thing, is for relics of, of religion, any religion, it, this is especially true. I think it's very hard to have a non-biased view of something and be able to take it as it is. I get that. And so I think that this was uncomfortable for a lot of people for the reason that they wanted it to be Jesus' shroud. But because of this carbon dating in 1988, the project came to a halt for like seven years because it was like, that's it. We know it's some guy. We know he has AB blood, but this dates back to 1350. So it's not Jesus. It's, it's just not. However, told you there were twists and turns. It fascinates me what jobs there actually are in the world. In one, per there is a job where you lift like grime off of objects to find traces of like pollen or plant life that minute that you can't even see to figure out where something might have been or gone or passed through and around the time of them dating the linen there was another person on the team who lifted grime basically off of the shroud and the grains, the pot, the stuff that he that he pulled off of the shroud is not grown in Europe. It's grown in the Middle East. Now, this takes us again back to um, some of the Eastern Byzantine, like Jew Middle Eastern Jewish, some Byzantium cultures of burial in this time. Maybe they still do it today. I don't know. But especially at this time when people are being put into tombs, they would have the linen shroud over them. And it was customary to take like dried flowers or grains or whatever plant life in the area for whatever particular reason, they would sprinkle, sprinkle it on top of the body, on top of the linen. So the body, the linen, and then the, the flowers and the grains would be sprinkled on top of it. So it makes sense that the person who lifted, if we know for sure that this is a burial shroud, it makes sense that the person who lifted off the grime found particles of plants basically on this shroud however again what he found was not from europe it was from the middle east so we're at a standstill because the scientists have part of the team has said no this linen is from thir medieval, medieval times in france but the person pulling the grime is like no honey we've got plant life 
that's not found in France and it's found in the Middle East and it matches burial ceremonies from 2000 years ago. So we're at a crossroads. Well, at that point, you know how I told you we were going to return back to the fire of like 1532? At that point, some of the scientists went, wait a minute, there was a fire in 1532. And we know that the House of Savoy, prior to this fire, had put the shroud in these like caskets, these like metal boxes to protect it. And we know that when the fire, are, we, we've been told, we don't know, we weren't there, but we, when the fire happened, what is recorded is that the main concern for the Savoy family was getting that shroud out of the house. And they went to this metal box, this coffin, which was super heavy. They couldn't lift it. And they could not get it to open. They couldn't remember, couldn't find the key. I was about to say combination. I don't think it was combination. It was a key. They couldn't find a key to open it. And so they had to get a blacksmith to come quickly in and get the box opened in order to remove the shroud by remember how i said part of it was damaged by the time they moved the shroud part of the metal had gotten on the linen and so a lot of the scientists in this group of modern day scientists believed at this point that the reason why the linen was dating back to middle mid, medieval times france is because of the metal that got stuck in the linen from the fire in 1532. That makes sense to me. That's logical because how else do we also have these old, this pollen and this, these old plant life on the shroud that's from 2000 years ago in the Middle East. So the explanation is obviously the, the, the fire damage. Now with that being said, we still don't have an answer. Like, I, I have an opinion, and the Cassiopeians, if you've been with me for a while, you know I often revert back to the Cassiopeians to see what they have to say about ordeals, ha also have an opinion. And it's interesting because my opinion actually matches the Cassiopeians' opinion, which I kind of was not to toot my own horn or anything, but I was like, that's kind of what I thought, too. You know, I think before we get into my opinion about this and the conclusion... I think sometimes, again, going back to that confirmation bias, sometimes if we're being very honest with ourselves, the mo moment of vulnerability, especially when we're dealing with our own mortality and our own religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, I think ev even the most faithful among us, the people who have the most faith in God, probably have moments of doubt. You know, sometimes life seems pretty meaningless. I think you're kidding yourself if you say you've never thought that. And I think sometimes in order for us to feel like there's meaning or that our religion is right, we need something to hold on to. And I believe that's why so many people try to cling to relics. You know, part of me sees this whole Shroud of Turin as being almost idolatry. Like that's becoming the focal point of worship versus God, you know, but as a human being, human be we're, co we're complicated, we're complex. And sometimes I think we have a hard time living in the gray. We want something magical. We want to believe in magic, even though we ourselves are magic, right? We want to believe in an, in an immaculate birth because that's magic, but isn't any birth magic? The fact that two humans come together and create a life, isn't that magic? We want, we want something spectacular. And the big question with the Shroud of Turin is, is this a hoax or is it Jesus of Nazareth? Well, what if it's neither? This has kind of been my perception all along. What if it's neither? What if it's not a hoax? What if it's actually a burial linen, but it's not Jesus? Because whoever that man was in that shroud, he himself as a living human being is also a miracle. Even though he lived many centuries before us, he's one of us. He was a human being. 
even though in my opinion it's not jesus and i'll again get to why also why i don't think it's jesus he was a he was somebody's father he was somebody's brother he was somebody's lover he was somebody's son whoever that man was wrapped in that burial shroud had a story just like you just like me that man had fears that man had hopes had dreams had love had guilt had pain and we don't know why he was unalived in this way there's no telling from that time period. I mean, he could have literally stolen a loaf of bread for his family or got on the wrong side of the emperor. There's no telling. But he was a human being and all lives matter. Isn't that what Jesus taught us? We are all sons and daughters of God. So even though I don't believe this is Jesus, I do believe it was another human being in that time and the cassiopeians say this which we're going to get to in a minute another reason why i don't think it's jesus and i think most of you know guys know why i've studied the missing books of the bible yashua the real person who jesus is based off of was never crucified i know that's hard for christians to hear and i please i ask that you have compassion in the comment section do not any type of bullying or a religious bullying will be blocked immediately. That is not how Yahshua taught us to behave. These are open conversations. When I started studying the missing books of the Bible, especially as someone who grew up Presbyterian, the whole basis of the religion is that this person was sacrificed. There was a blood sacrifice for you. And when I read the missing books of the Bible and I realized that the Jesus story actually comes from the Dionysian cult, which is what the Freemasons are based off of. And it's also mixed in with Mithraism, which we've talked about a lot. And I realized that the real guy, the real dude, was never crucified. I felt like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. Of course. Of course he wasn't. The God that I worship, the God that I believe in, does not require human sacrifice the god that i believe in creates life expects us to respect other lives the god that i believe in would never ask for a horrific sacrifice where human blood is spilled so that made sense to me now of course i was so excited when i came to youtube to be like guess what guys it's 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 this isn't what happened. Like, we're good. Like, you don't, this is good. We're good. Like, this is not what happened. Of course, I got a lot of backlash. I got a lot of threats, you know, because that's the whole basis of the Christian faith. But it's not. It's the basis of, of the Dionysian cult and the Mithraism. It's a form of Satanism. It's not a form of Yahshua. Yahshua is about love and life and honoring life, right? And so, of course, the missing books of the Bible are missing for a reason because they don't want us to know that. They want us to be subservient to an organization like the church. We, we know that Peter, you know, the guy that Jesus, the rock upon which Jesus built his church, we know from the missing books of the Bible, that's not true either. We know that. But the person who was responsible for the church, for it wasn't even a church, it was an organ, because church comes from a kirk, which comes from a demon that means to mind control and feed off, that's a story for a different day. So his organization, his disciples, his sadhana, that it was supposed to go to his wife and his brother. Of course, that's, you know, if, if my boyfriend, heaven forbid, were to pass away, I would take over his business. Like, you know, it, it's, that, that's common sense. It wouldn't go to some random dude that's in your group, your posse. It'll go to your family, right? And so the main reason why I know this isn't Jesus is because Yahshua wasn't crucified. The God I believe in. Lucifer, Lucifer requires human sacrifice, painful human sacrifice, but the real God doesn't. That's not how you worship the real God, by spilling somebody else's blood. And so that's why I, the main reason why I know that that was not the person people think it is. But again, with that being said, whoever that, that man was, I want to know about him. 
what was his life like? Did he have children? I mean, isn't it wild to think you could be a descendant of this man and you would never know? Now, with that being said, that was my assumption kind of all along. And I definitely made sure to do my research before I went to see if the Cassiopeians had said anything about the, the Shroud of Turin. Didn't know if they had or not, but I Googled it. And let's take a look at what the Cassiopeia. I was very excited when I realized I kind of nailed it on the head because this is what the Cassiopeians have to say. This channeling was done in 1994 when the Cassiopeians were first channeled. They've been channeled for 40 years now and they have yet to be wrong. So it says, question, Laura Knight, ask, I would like to know if the Shroud of Turin was ever wrapped around Jesus. Answer, no. Question, Laura, was it wrapped around somebody who was, I'm not going to say the word, but you can see it on the screen. Answer, no. Question, Laura, how was it made? Wrapped around Roman worker. Question, Laura, what caused the image on the shroud? Answer, body oils, hormones, and other physiological chemicals. There was a second reading from the Cassiopeians that goes as follows. Question, Laura. Okay, forget that. Now I am reading this book called The Jesus Conspiracy about the Shroud of Turin. Now, we asked once about this, and you said the image was of a Roman worker. Apparently, this worker was unalive. Was this individual who was unalive done so in this specific manner as was described for Jesus with deliberate intent to create the illusion that the image of the shroud had to be Jesus since Jesus was the only person who could have possibly su suffered all these exact wounds as described in the Gospels? Answer, no. This form of unaliving was once a popular punishment method. So with the second reading, you can see Laura Knight kind of echoing what I said in the beginning, what a lot of us have been trained to think this was specific only to Jesus. And the Cassiopeians are saying, no, this was actually done a lot. This was a Roman worker. Now, we talked a little bit about the whole Jewish thing, and we do know that some of, of Yahshua's students were Jewish. They were Greek. They were Jewish. They were, you know, he was, he didn't care, just like most of us don't care where you come from. It's about who you are, right? It doesn't matter where you come from. And with this being said, it's one of the least interesting things about Yahshua to me, but it does bear repeating. Yahshua was Egyptian. Surprise, surprise. According to the missing books of the Bible, he was not Jewish. He was Egyptian. He was part of the priesthood and priestesshood of Isis, as was his mother, as was Magdalene. Again, do your own research, please. Don't believe what I say. Just do your own research. I have my own speculations and theories as to why they changed him, changed his ethnicity. The powers that be changed his ethnicity from Jewish to Egyptian. But nonetheless, he was Egyptian. So if he had been unalive in this manner, I would, I would assume that his disciples would have taken care of his body in the method that the Egyptians did. So, again... Please don't take my word for it. Please do your own research. You can, People have asked me where you can find the missing books of the Bible. Just Google them. A lot of these missing books, I mean, there's over 700 missing books of the Bible. So we haven't covered all of them, but there's at least 50 out there that you can get your hands on. Just Google it. And you can, you can find most of the missing books I read from a PDF. Oh, oh, I printed it off the internet. I only have a few that I actually ordered. So you can do it for free. You know, and I would say if this is challenging you or triggering you, I would again say none of that really matters anyway. You are a beautiful human being. You are a fractal of God. You are so loved. You are so fabulous. You are so amazing. There's nothing you can do to win God's favor. There are things you have to do to win Lucifer's favor. But God you're perfect the way you are. Use the lessons, use the triggers, use the obstacles that you face in this life as ways to refine your soul. You're already saved. Do you really think, for those who are parents, think about your child. 
your child that you gave birth to or adopted, the, the child that you're responsible, that you love more than life itself, would you really cast them into hell for eternity? Of course not. There's nothing that child could do to make you not love that child. That's how God feels about you. There's nothing you can do that's going to make God not love you. You were born already saved just by being alive. You don't need a relic. You don't need to believe anything. You don't need magical thinking. All you need is to just be. One of my favorite verses from the Bible is be still and know that I am God. Just be still and know. I know that's hard. I, I think they've done a number on our minds. We know the church is part of the bad guys. We know it's just proven that that's part of the puppeteers of the world. All big world religions are, not just Christianity. So if this is hard for you to hear and you feel like projecting and lashing out, just know that fear is false evidence appearing real. And you are wonderfully and wholly made. And you are perfectly, there's nothing you have to do to gain that love of God. But anyway, with that being said, I cannot wait to hear you guys what you think down in the comment section below. Have you been on some weird journey with the Shroud of Turin? Have you kind of thought it was a hoax? Again, please be respectful. I know that this is a tough episode because it does deal with religious beliefs. Please be respectful. Please do not name call anybody for having a different opinion than you. Opinions are simply that. They're just opinions. They're always subject to change. They're not facts. So just be respectful. And if you are a Christian and this is triggering for you, I would kindly ask, if you are a Christian, act Christ-like in the comments. Don't berate people, love people, because you can learn a lot from people who have a different opinion than you. All right, you guys, I am so excited. We're getting, I, what I'm going to start doing for those, Mystery Mondays have been my favorite, but we haven't really been doing Mystery Mondays because I was doing the Romanoffs for a long time, which did end in a mystery, which was Anastasia Romanoff, if she survived or not. But what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to shift all of my deep dives, kind of what I used to do. I'm kind of going back to my old template. I'm going to shift all of my deep dives into the week. And then Miss Mondays are going to be for mysteries, for goofy mysteries. I am on the lookout now for some really cool, like unsolved stuff that we can talk about. You know, I'm not someone that really needs to have like an answer all the time. Sometimes I think the, mo the more fun, the, the more we don't know, the more fun it becomes because, um, there's always wonder, right? When we don't have an answer, there's always wonder and there's always possibility. So I'm really excited. If you guys have mysteries that you want me to cover or conspiracies that you want me to cover, you can send me an email at esotericatlanta at gmail.com. Sometimes I get flooded with emails. So if it takes me a while to respond, that's why. And I apologize. Sometimes I do miss emails because I get so many emails at one time. If, if there's something, that if, if, if you can't reach me my email, just put it in the comment section. I'm pretty good. Unless I'm away from my computer, I'm pretty good about checking checking the comments. So you can always put suggestions in the comment section too. And I can see what I can find because if you're new to this channel, as I said earlier, I love, I'm petty, I'm petty and I love to gossip. And so history is like, and mysteries and this kind of stuff is the most fun thing for me because I will dig and I will dig and I will dig because I am so petty and I'm so, I, I'm, I am, I will snoop around. I will just snoop, 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 snoop. So, so if there's anything that you want me to look into for you, like a mystery for Mystery Monday, put it in the comment section. I'll also leave in the description guys bo uh, box, guys, I will leave um, my playlist for Mystery Monday. If you're someone like me and you like dig unsolved mysteries and like really weird things that have happened, um, I have a huge Mystery Monday. I mean, for four years now, I've been doing Mystery Monday. So I have a huge playlist with all sorts of really interesting stories that I've covered over the years. So if you go down to the description box for those who don't, that's the box right under this video it's closed you have to open it that's how youtube sets it up so you have to hit the show more button or the down button in my description box always up top are sponsorships because without sponsors and without our patrons we would not keep the lights on so that comes first but then you will see show notes 
under show notes in every video is going to be other videos that I've referenced, playlists that I've referenced, or any articles or anybody else's channel that I might have read. It's always going to be different per video depending on what the subject is. So it's down there. You can hit that. If, if you still don't know what I'm talking about, just go to my homepage, hit playlist, and you'll see Mystery Monday, and you can entertain yourself for hours with all those old stories that I have from the years of doing Mystery Monday. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. Quick story, because I a lot of you guys are now my friends. Y'all, not to change the subject, but in case you've ever had one of those days where you feel like a complete idiot, can I tell you guys what I did quickly before we... Let me make fun of myself for a second. So I'm actually filming this on Sunday, June 2nd for next Monday when you're watching this. I taught this morning, I teach every Sunday morning, and then I went to the grocery store and then I came home and I was gonna film this. And so I was getting out of my car and I grabbed my grocery bags and I got to my front door, here are my car keys. I literally sat there at my front door clicking my door for a good probably two minutes, like clicking the unlock button. And then I would do the hands on. I was like, why is my door not unlocking? And I kept hitting my button, my unlock button, tr trying to get Y'all, I hope my neighbors didn't see. It took, literally took me about two minutes to realize that was my car key. And my house key is right here. I felt like such an idiot. My hands were full. I pray to God my neighbors did not see me. My, I don't know where my mind was. I know I, like I said, I just taught. I went to the grocery store. I was already mentally preparing to film this. Y'all, my dog, I want, you know, my dog, Ravi, I couldn't wait to see him because I hadn't seen him all morning. And so I could hear him on the other side of the door, like getting excited. And I was like, why? Why is my door not opening? So let me know if you've ever done that. Like, what the hell was that? <laughs> so totally, you're totally free to make fun of me because I'm making fun of myself for that idiotic move that I made. I know my car kept like beeping and I was like, why is the car beeping? <laughs> anyway, if you've ever done something stupid like that, let me know down in the comment section below. If, if you don't wanna let us know, that's fine too. Just know you're not alone. We all do stupid stuff sometimes. So anyway, guys, I hope you're having a wonderful week and I will talk to you soon. Bye everybody.